amazing ways. Your disappointment leads to God's sovereign appointment in amazing ways. Well, if you're in a disappointment right now, this is going to sound harsh. It's not going to sound helpful at all. It's going to sound confusing. And that even that statement might tick you off in the middle of your disappointment because you're like, well, I'm disappointed now. I don't really care what God's going to do. But I have to ask you a very serious question. I have to ask you, does being a Christian matter in disappointment? And the answer to that question, I would say, depends. Disappointment stings. Disappointment hurts. It upsets us. But you and I have been given a will. We have been given a church. We just heard about some of our values. We're here today in part because of friendship and community. We state that the scriptures teach and that we believe that we need one another and we need the Lord. So, you know, we're a body. Do you know that in the physical body, when there's a cut, there's a rush of white blood cells to stop the bleeding and do clotting and to prevent infection? There are those here who would like to help you with your disappointment within this body, which is why friendship and community are critical in our lives. What I'm saying is God does not intend for you to face your disappointments alone. He never did. He's even given us promises in his word to help us with disappointment. So my question was, does being a Christian matter when you're facing disappointment? And I would say that that question depends on you. Will you choose to cling to God's word and his promises? Will you choose to move towards a little bit more faith to help you in this disappointment? Will you allow someone that God brings into your life reach out to you and to help you in your disappointment? Who faced more disappointment than Job in the Bible who lost everything? And we read that he clung to the Lord, he cried out to the Lord, and he believed that God was in it, even with the disappointment. And he wrote in Job 42.2, I know that you can do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Now that's beautiful because when we face disappointment, what we wanted was thwarted. It didn't happen. It didn't pull off. We were, were hurt. But even in the midst of his disappointments, Job is believing that no purpose of the Lord's can be thwarted. I want to encourage you today that the Lord means to redeem your experience of disappointment with his sovereign leading in your lives. Now we're going to trace a person throughout this message, the person of Moses. Moses was a prophet, a leader of God's people that he raised up. And yet Moses faces in his call a lot of disappointments. What kept him going in the midst of great disappointments he faced? Well, we're going to learn that today. If you go clear back to Genesis, God had a plan for his people. He wasn't silent. He laid it out. And he says in Genesis 15, the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and they will be servants there. They'll be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. Now this promise would have been repeated over and over and over again, and the people of Israel would have known this promise. And when Moses was born, in the midst of the time when they were in that very captivity, families and their homes would have brought this back. This isn't going to be forever. God has promised, he's given us his word, that there will be a deliverer that comes. So this is being repeated over and over. Moses is born, and it was a very tragic time in Israel's life. The Pharaoh had saw the people multiplying, said, I want all the baby boys to be left out to be exposed or tossed in the river to be drowned. And Moses' parents feared God, and they made a little basket for him and put him in the basket and put it in the river, hoping that he would be found and he would survive. And he was found. He was found by none other than Pharaoh's daughter herself. And she saw him crying. She had pity on him. She took him and raised him in Pharaoh's court. He learned all that he needed to know about being a monarch and a leader of Egypt. 
Acts 7 gives us a window when Stephen is being uh, asked to give his uh, testimony, which ends up getting him stoned. But there's a very, very important little clip in the middle of Acts 7, beginning with verse 23. When he was 40 years old, so he was in this court learning all about Egyptian leadership and life for 40 years. When he was 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel, which would mean that he had very little contact with these slaves before then. So he visited them, and listen, goes on, he supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. So Moses believed that he was a deliverer. He took matters into his own hand. He saw a Hebrew being um, tortured by an Egyptian, and he killed the guy and hit him in the sand. And he wanted peace. The next day, two Hebrews were fighting, and he tried to stop them. And the one said, are you going to try and kill us like you did the Egyptian? And they rejected him. They rejected him as the deliverer. And worse, the matter became known to Pharaoh. Pharaoh set out to kill Moses, and Moses had to now flee. Now, the key passage to understand at this point is that Acts 7.25, he supposed that his brothers would understand that God gave, was giving salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. He supposed. They didn't. So, sadness and displeasure by unfulfilled hopes and experience, expectations, this happened to Moses. He supposed that. So, this morning, I'm wondering what you supposed that. You supposed that you fill in the blank, that my investments would succeed, that COVID would be done by now, that kids would all be back to school with no stipulations, that she would say yes when you proposed, that you would not lose your job, that you would have licked this habit by now, you suppose. So the supposings in life are going to lead us to disappointments. I suppose that the sore behind my ear in the doctor's office was a wound and it was cancer. That's a true story. I supposed that the repair in my car would be 150 bucks, but being kind of a traditional pessimist, I told my wife it's probably going to be 200 bucks. It was 500 bucks. That was a disappointment. Disappointment always hurts, and it did for Moses too. He took off, and he went to the wilderness. He was no longer a bigwig in Pharaoh's court. In fact, he was on the other end of the spectrum. He was in the wilderness tending sheep, and we know that to Egyptians, shepherds were despised. It was like the worst job possible. But tending sheep, he noticed one day a burning bush that was not being consumed, and he went toward it, and then it happened. God spoke. Now, at this point in his life, I want to suggest that we can know from what happened in Pharaoh's court to being in the wilderness tending sheep that Moses was deeply humbled. Keep that in mind. James 4.10 says, Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. So in Exodus 3.4, when the Lord saw uh, that he had... Um, when, when Moses saw the burning bush and the Lord saw him approaching, Moses said, Lord, uh, or God said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here, I, here am I. And the Lord said, don't come near, take off your sandals, for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the Lord your God, your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. And I want to ask you this morning, why did Moses even care? Disappointed, shafted in Egypt, fled, now doing the lowest job in the totem pole. Why did Moses care? I want to submit that he experienced humility. He renewed his reverence in God, and it strengthened his faith. 
I'm going to repeat these three things a few times, and you might ask me later why they're not in the notes, because God gave me those three words this morning. <laughs> so he does that to me sometimes. You'll see that he was humbled. We know he was humbled. He's got the worst job he could have. But the reason he cared, remember that promise given back in Genesis? He did not give up on that. He still had reverence for God. We know he had reverence for God because he bowed when the Lord said, this is me. A lot of people become so prideful when the Lord says through his word or a friend, this is the Lord, and you're like, I don't give a rip. I'm hurting. What that is, is pride. And Moses' pride, remember, I'm the deliverer. <laughs> he didn't even consult the Lord back in Egypt. He just took it in his hand and killed the Egyptian. Well, now he is humbled. He's reverenced before God. And his faith is bringing strength. And he knew the promises of God, that God was going to deliver his people. And Moses learned something that you and I need to learn. I don't think you're going to wake up one morning and just get it. But we need to learn that our disappointments can lead to God's sovereign appointments. Moses thought he was mistaken. He wasn't the guy. Well, his call was right, but his timing was wrong. God needed a man who knew the wilderness like the back of his hand because God knew that they were going to be wandering in that wilderness for 40 years. Moses knew the whole thing. He spent 40 years, 40 more years, in the wilderness shepherding the sheep. And then God was ready when the servant was ready. No one's called to a ministry too quickly. No missionary ends up on the field early. God is working. God is shaping the man or the woman, and then he's ready to use them. So God's servant was ready. Moses had taken matters in his own hands. God had humbled him. He learned to reverence God, to trust God in a new way. He knew to keep God's promises. And then the Lord says, And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression which the Egyptians have oppressed them. Next verse. He wasn't expecting this. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God's appointment, God's timing, God's will. God is working in your life. God has an appointment in the midst of your disappointment. Our job is to let our pride go, to humble ourselves before God again, to learn to reverence him and have him strengthen our faith. He is going to do this. Secondly, learn that you always have something greater than your current disappointment. I think as Americans, we really, really need this. Because a lot of our satisfaction and desires and what we want come not from the Lord. There are other things. We, we want the Lord, but we really would like, you know, a nice house. We want the Lord, but we really like, you know, the perfect family. We want the Lord, but, you know, it'd be really nice to have nice clothes and car and what have you. And we have to learn that that's not how it works. Our greatest satisfaction in life, God means to wean us and move us towards having that greatest satisfaction being in Jesus Christ alone. When I feel disappointed by God, it's because at that moment, listen now, something I'm longing for is a little bit more important to me than him. That's the problem. It's our focus. It's not that we can't have desires. It's not that we can't uh, try and plan and what have you. But we will face disappointments. Moses trusted God's promise to deliver, and then Moses trusted himself to impulsively pull that off. He had a lot to learn during that wilderness. And the Lord says to him in 3.6 in Exodus, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. I wonder this morning if you're in a wilderness right now. Sometimes God allows us to spend a season of time in the wilderness to help us set aside our pride and to move towards humility, reverence to him in a new way, and fresh faith. If you let him, it'll be just like Moses. You're, you'll be strengthened. You, your faith will be encouraged. You will reverence God in new ways. You'll show up to worship the Lord here, and no matter 
how things are, your heart's right with God, and you're seeking him, and you want satisfaction from him. It is right here that I have to painfully share with you as a pastor for a long time. It's right here that a lot of people check out. The disappointment's heavy. The pride is high. They do not want to humble themselves. They want it their way. They become bitter at God, really snarly inside. Is that a word? I don't know. can add that to the Don Dictionary if it's not. A... But we do. It's kind of... It's kind of ugly. You can still do Minnesota nice, but inside you're kind of snarly towards God. And it's because pride's standing in the way. You need to write down humility, reverence, and faith. Those are the three words that God gave to me that it's going to get us out of this ditch. So the story continues, and God says, I'm going to send you. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Now, just look at that. I mean, a little while back, well, a long while back, 40 years back, he was like, he killed a guy because he was confident. The, the, the new aha for me was that Acts passage where it tells us that, that Moses believed he was the guy. He believed, he knew that passage that God was sending into the little bird, and he believed he was the guy. So he just started killing Egyptians. But now, he needs God's confidence and not his. God's confidence. Who, who am I? And the answer God gave him was in verse 12, but I will be with you. So see, that's putting Jesus in that very front satisfaction point. If Jesus is with me, if, if he's for me, if he's calling me, I can do this. It's not me. The glory's going to go to him. Then Moses goes, well, what if they don't believe me? And then there's a story God gives him miracles to do. And then he goes on, you know, he goes, well... He was planning on fighting, right? He knew how to fight. He'd been trained as a warrior during that 40 years in Egypt. That's why he could kill that Egyptian. But he wasn't a great speaker. In fact, he had a, a stuttering problem. And so his next thing is, you know, well, I have never been eloquent. Neither, in, you know, I can go battle, but, you know, don't make me the talk guy. And then the Lord says to him, God's appointment for your disappointment who made man's mouth or made him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what to say. That, my dear friends, is how you get out of the wilderness. Pride's gone, humility before the Lord, completely dependent on him. And if he's saying, you know what? You're right. I, you don't have the greatest voice, Moses. But I picked you. You can do this. I am calling you to serve me. Let him become your satisfaction. I think maybe you could be hanging on too tightly to your hopes and expectations because that is pride. Maybe it's time to learn that you always have something greater than your disappointment, the Lord himself. So you can have goals, you can have dreams, but you hold those loosely in your hand and you hold Jesus Christ with the strongest grip that you can find. You've got him always, and he wants to be the center. After the deliverance from the Red Sea, we find a different Moses. He had matured. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him, my Father's God. I will exalt him. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds and doing wonders? Who is this person? This is not the person going, oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you want me. I don't think I can do this. This is a person giving all the glory to God and trusting him. The Lord became Moses' satisfaction and was greater than all the disappointments during all of those plagues and, and the deliverance and the Red Sea experience. Let me ask you this morning, what is your greatest hope? What is your greatest expectation with everything you're facing? I'm just give you a few passages to whet your appetite. 
Psalm 34:10. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. That means in the midst of my disappointments, this passage is still true. I lack no good thing. Psalm 16, 2, I say to the Lord, you are my helper. I have nothing good apart from you. Psalm 73, 25, whom have I in heaven but you? Now, can we say this? Would this be like a prayer goal for us? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. See, there's putting that satisfaction, that hope in Jesus, not all these other things that I want. And then finally, Paul in Philippians 3, 8, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Philippians 3, 8. All these passages have one thing in common. Greatest satisfaction came from the Lord himself, knowing him, seeking him, allowing him to be very close to you. So my last point is a little bit tricky. Choose to hope again, but fight to trust in Jesus as your satisfaction. So if you're disappointed, if you've got stuff going on, this is a call based on the word of God that we can hope in him again. But then when you do, it's really easy to slip back and have our desires and goals and what have you be focused on us and what we want versus, you know, these are things that we may need or that we're, we're going after. But our greatest satisfaction, I mean, that doesn't change, right, at this part of the message. We still need to have trust in Jesus as a greatest satisfaction. When your heart has faced disappointment, you feel crunched and hope dies. Sometimes you vow never to try again. No more risk, no more dating, no more marriage, no more helping because you got burned. No more church. God disappointed me. I can't trust him again. Well, we're wanting to get that back. So look at me. You, you are not in heaven yet. You live on a fallen earth. We, we are still people who possess sin, we, we are going to have disappointments in this life. Disappointment's going to happen, and God does not want us to grow bitter because that's that pride we were talking about earlier. He wants us to come and have faith again, and so hope again, but just don't put all your cookies on the next expectation. He wants you to learn to trust Jesus as your true source. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And he said, but I will be with you. So right there is the temptation to give up, and God has called us to hope in him again. And so he was trained that the Lord is enough. You and I need to be trained that we don't need more money, more influence, more success, certain clothes, certain looks, certain name. We need the Lord. That's where our final satisfaction has to be, be and, to, and to stay there. This is not going to be a quick prayer, a one-time recommitment. This is a process by where we learn to wean ourselves from having our greatest joy and satisfaction come, you know, in, you know, getting that new car, in, in, in getting that new phone. You know, finally getting that guy or that girl that you longed for. Greatest hope and satisfaction, you know. Business grows or doubles or what have you. Now, you can learn a lot about humility when those things don't happen, but the Lord's going to bless you. So when he blessed Israel and he said, when you get into that land and you're like building homes and things are looking good, he's like, remember, don't forget me. And we're kind of prone to do that. So that, I just want to pitch that this is a process. The Lord means to wean me from dependence on me and stuff and help me fight for satisfaction in him. And so Moses learned to hope again. So they go to Pharaoh and he says, Thus says the Lord, let my people go. You know, he's got his confidence back and he's, he's gone. And... You're going to learn through Moses that this is a daily choice that we must have to grow in this. This story unfolds kind of interesting. Pharaoh goes, who's the Lord? Why should I listen to him? You guys are lazy. Take away their straw, make them work harder. And so it got even more horrible. So he comes back with this confidence, and then everything's like falling apart, and Moses is disappointed again. In 522, Moses turned to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, 
Why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? <laughs> so it's, I really like that for me because I'm like, yeah, go follow the Lord. You know, okay, we're going to do this. And then something happens and I'm like, I'm crunched. <laughs> oh God, why did this happen? And it's like, this is exactly what happened to Moses. But Moses' disappointment was God's appointment. After he gets done kind of getting everything out, the Lord looks at him and goes, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. It's not Moses, you know, just going to go in there and go, let my people go, and Pharaoh's going to go, oh, okay, you guys can go now. So it's all the, the plagues that gave glory to God, all of which were kind of a crunch against different Egyptian gods, like flies and what have you. And it, God was going to get all the glory. So when you hope... Just keep turning your affection back to Jesus and saying, that's what I want. I want to contrast a couple passages for you on this point. Oh, Lord, why have you done this? Why did you ever send me? Okay, he's growing. It's happening again. And the Lord doesn't say, I'm done with you. When he goes, I can't speak, send somebody else. The Lord didn't go, I'm done with you. He is growing our faith. So contrast that statement with, let's fast forward it to the Red Sea. The Lord tells him to go to this spot, mountain on one side, mountain on the other side, Red Sea in front of them. Pharaoh and his chariots are coming down behind them. They are stuck, and the people are all crying out, you know, why did you bring us here to die? Kind of like Moses. Moses has a different response. Moses was growing in this, moving the pride away, choosing humility before God, reverencing him and trusting him in a new way. And Moses says in Exodus 14, verse 13, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be still. I think that is amazing. That is demonstrating to, to you, to me, to Moses himself, that he's learning to submit to God afresh and to learn that God is his satisfaction. I want to leave you with one passage of Scripture that encapsulates all this truth from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. That's faith. Do not lean on your own understanding. That's humility. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That's reverence. And he will make your path straight. To trust the Lord with all of your heart is to make him my sweetest satisfaction for all. Disappointments are like black dots in your lives. They're just kind of there, these random black dots, and we don't like them. We want them gone. And I read a little devo in Streams in the Desert that said a man drew some black dots and we looked and could not make anything out of these irregular assemblage of black dots. There they were, just on a piece of paper. Then he drew a few lines, put in a few rests and a clef at the beginning and we saw that these black dots were musical notes. And upon sounding them, we found ourselves singing, Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. These many black dots and disappointments that we understand in our lives have been permitted by God. But if we let God into our lives to adjust our dots in the proper way, the way that he wants, and let him separate this from that and put in the rest in the proper places, and out of the black dots of our disappointments, God will make a glorious harmony. Our job is to not become prideful and hinder what he's doing. So I want to challenge you this week. Your disappointments lead to God's appointments. Learn that there's something more satisfying than what you wanted anyway. And choose to hope in God again, but fight to trust in Jesus. This week, I want you to look for one area where you need to humble yourself before God. God's antidote for the corrosiveness of disappointment 
is going to be foiled by pride. So one area that I can humble myself, choose this week one way that you could honor God and show him some reverence. You could maybe write him a note or sing a song. Embrace one of those promises that are in your notes that I gave you earlier. And then I want you especially to meditate on, maybe you'll even memorize Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Just let that passage sink into your soul in the midst of your disappointment. Pray with me. Father, we want Jesus to be our satisfaction. We want you to come and renew our faith in you. This isn't about becoming a Christian again. This is about Christians that God loves and desires, who wants to take us to a place where you are our complete satisfaction, where we can look at disappointments in a new way. Have your way in our lives with this, God, please. Teach us how to humble ourselves and to just trust and reverence you in a new way and allow our faith to actually be strengthened in the midst of a disappointment that we're facing. In Jesus' name, amen.